Um, before I introduce our guests, I just want to say a little bit about the society because um, some of you might be new here. Um, so with women in law, um, we're hoping to increase diversity and inclusion of women and minority groups, including BAME, disability and social mobility in the legal profession. And we're hoping events like this will achieve that. Um, we hope to give women to opportunity hope to give opportunities to women, non-binary and men to gain the skills they need to be able to have the confidence to share their full ability and truly be able to work towards their ideal legal career. And we also know the importance of including men in this conversation and making sure that awareness of lack of diversity goes throughout and making sure that equality and representation in the workplace is a reality. Um, so if I could just ask the guests to um, mute themselves and put on the video if they'd like to. Um, thank you. Um, so would we be able to start with introducing yourselves and the current role that you're in? If we start with, do we want to start with Sherry for that? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for this invite. Um, it's really nice um, to see this happen because when I was at uni, I didn't think we had a site like this. So it's really nice to see. Um, so yeah, I am Sharifat. I graduated from uh, Union of Guns uh, two years ago, so in 2018, um, doing law. And I'm currently now a paralegal um, so I am in the government legal department, but I'm actually within the Department of Education. Um, so I sit in the legal advisor's office and we basically advise policy clients um, within the Department of Education. Um, yeah, in just in policies, um, any regulations, all the national lockdown restrictions that um, just happened recently in regards to schools and sort of things that um, kind of day-to-day -day things that I do. Um, would like to go next, just to give a brief introduction to what they do, if that's possible. Thank you. Go oh, next. So, is that okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Hi. Hi, so my name is Gamzi and I am a current LLM and CPPC student at CPP. Um, I'm, I would have finished this year had it been for Corona. Um, I'm also a paralegal at the Department of Health and Social Care Legal Advisors. So exactly as um, Sherifat said, I do the same thing except in the health sphere, basically. Okay, thank you. Um, well, so I was just going to say, if anyone's got any questions as we go along, um, just drop them in the chat and we'll get some at the end. So. Um, with questions, I'd like to hear from both of you. I think we were meant to have um, Mel on the call as well, but I don't think, has Mel joined yet? Uh, Mel's just left. I think maybe she's having internet issues. Okay. Um, I will. Thank you. Um, well, I think we'll get started and then hopefully if Mel can come back, we can ask her some questions too. So um, we start with um, Cherry for that. Um, would you be able to talk a little bit about when you first became interested in law and when you decided to do a law degree? Yeah, sure, thank you. Um, so I think when I first became interested in law, probably be in sixth form, um, so I had a bit of unconventional route um, during sixth form when I was my A-levels, I actually chose like maths and sciences. Um, yeah, because, you know, you know, when you sort of do well, do okay in all of your subjects in GCSEs and you're like okay I don't really know what to do so I just kind of picked this and I think then I thought I'll maybe do something like doctor or something but clearly not um <laughs> but like not too long after I picked those subjects in year 12 I just realized that I wasn't I was working hard but it just I just wasn't really enjoying them um and then so at the end of my first year year 12, I kind of had to decide whether I wanted to carry on doing, um, you know, these subjects that I didn't really enjoy or kind of start afresh. And oh, luckily- right. got it, got it. Oh, I think some people have just joined. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, so luckily um, I, when I did A-levels then, and I'm not sure, I don't know if that's the case anymore, but we had, 
exams in year 12 so you could sort of like gauge how you were doing and things like that so I just thought it's time to jump ship now so I actually then started year 12 over again and then I did um, um, I did history English um, politics and history um, and psychology um, and really really enjoyed those and I was quite surprised and I thought what sort of subject can like bring all of these together you know um, and then I just thought oh like law and uh, at the time I was also like doing something with Amnesty International my school so I think I had the whole I want to be a human rights lawyer I want to save the world <laughs> sort of thing um, and yeah so then that just ended up obviously transpiring to me um, doing uh, undergrad at UOB. Okay, thank you. Um, hi Mel, um, I just um, introduced myself at the start. Um, obviously, as, you, as Mary emailed you, she couldn't be here, so I'm the events assistant. Yeah. And I just asked um, the others to give a brief introduction to themselves, so would you be able to do that for us? Yeah, so shall I just kick off now? I'm sorry to not have joined right at the start. I seem to have trouble getting in, but Hi everyone, thank you so much for inviting me to come and talk to you. So let me just tell you a little bit about myself. I'm currently legal director at the Department of uh, Health and Social Care. So I'm part of the government legal profession. I'm part of the government legal department. Um, actually soon I'm about to leave the Department for Health and Social Care and I'm becoming the director of litigation for the government legal department which is effectively a cross Whitehall job so I'm going to be in charge of all the many many thousands of cases that are brought uh, against the government it's usually that way round brought against the government um, but let me tell you a little bit shall I about my journey to becoming um, a lawyer so um, I started life actually as an English graduate um, Yes, I had always been interested in the law. You know, I was one of those people who did watch all the programmes there were about, you know, being in court and being an advocate and thought maybe I wanted to be a lawyer. But um, actually, I loved English. So I went and read English. I was at Durham University. I graduated a very long time ago. I'm very much older than all of you on this call, for sure. Um, and when I graduated, I thought, well, I don't know that I want to do more studying. Um, I love books, uh, I love the publishing world, or I think I love the publishing world, so I went to be a copy editor in a publishing house, and I was there for a couple of years, um, and it was a legal publishing house, Sweeter Maxwell, um, who some of you might recognise the name of, um, and I had a choice to make, do I stay in publishing and move into general publishing, or do I become a lawyer, and actually I had found whilst I was doing my editing job that I preferred or was more interested in the law probably than I was actually the production of books which rather surprised me. Um, so I then went and did the conversion course uh, and trained as a barrister and I went to City University which is one of the places that people um, I think still tend to go to if they want to be a barrister. Uh, and I was in chambers for about gosh about four or five years in total uh, and I was a chancery barrister, which basically meant that I did lots of property law and I did some charity law and I did lots of wills and trusts. So you guys, if you're studying law, you know, you'll think of it as land law and equity and trust probably. And you know what? I was pretty miserable. I just was absolutely not for me. It was really hard to get a tendency as a woman and as an Asian woman. I mean, this is back in the, you know, 1990s. So, you know, uh, uh, 25 years or so ago and it was pretty unheard of to be a person of colour um, let alone a woman of colour at the bar particularly the chancery bar um, and I felt anyway that it didn't really suit me terribly well I had gone into law because I wanted to change the world actually and I wanted to make the law and I wanted to make the world a better place if I'm honest um, and in actual fact, I found myself going up and down the country making lots and lots of people homeless because I was engaged by one of the big mortgage providers. And at that stage, we had just come out of a recession and lots of people were struggling to make their mortgage payments. And I found, found myself thinking, this is really not what I became a lawyer to do. My values just don't align at all with what I'm doing. And whilst I was going through that, you know, slight misery, frankly, in my mid-20s, um, I saw an advert for the Charity Commission, 
Now, the Charity Commission is a regulator and it regulates charities. It registers them, but it also investigates them if they don't do um, uh, you know, what they're meant to do. It was a, a temporary job. It was only for a year, but I thought, well, I'll go. And if I don't like it, I'll go back to the bar maybe or become a charity specialist. I'd always done a lot of work for charitable trust in my in my day to day practice. And of course, I went and loved it, completely fell in love with a government legal profession. And then at the end of a year, you know, I was on a temporary contract. Do I stay at the Charity Commission? They offered me a permanent job. Do I go back to private practice? I was pretty certain that wasn't what I was going to do. Or do I move into the wider government profession? Now, for someone like me, who has a real sort of dedication to public service, who wants um, to change the law, you know, this is where we get to change the law, who um, actually wants a lot of responsibility early, because again, that's what you absolutely get. And for somebody who enjoys politics, you know, we are where politics and law collides with policy to change, you know, the legal landscape. If you love all of those things, the government legal profession and the government legal department is definitely for you. So I decided at that stage to jump from the Charity Commission to the wider government profession. And I stand, started at the Department for Education working on teachers policy. And I have had the most incredible career sorry I'll stop for I'll stop in a moment but I have had this incredible career where I've made it from junior lawyer to the director of a legal division I'm soon going to be running a group of 650 people with um, 30 of the most senior lawyers who manage all of those people but along the way I've worked for the cabinet office number 10 the Ministry of Justice, uh, the uh, Department of Transport. I've worked on House of Lords Reform. I was the first lawyer involved in human rights coordination across Whitehall, the devolution of settlements, freedom of information. Again, I was the first lawyer that worked on freedom of information across Whitehall. Um, in uh, my current job, I did the Charlie Gard case, which some of you may remember was a baby who very sadly was terminally ill and it was working out what was to do in the, his best interests. And most latterly, I've been leading the response to the coronavirus. So I get to get up every day to go to work, to uphold the rule of law, to help the government govern, govern well, to speak truth to power. That sometimes can be a very difficult uh, and challenging thing to do but it's constitutionally incredibly important that me and my colleagues go to work every day to do that 25 years on or 20 years on I'm still very excited by what I do and absolutely love it shall I stop there Louisa and um, you know there may be questions or uh, other people who want to come in yeah um, thank you very much that was very interesting how much of a breadth Obviously, it's you know 25 years, but that's really interesting. So, if I could just come to Gamzi now, just to give her insight on what she's done so far. Hi, I'm so pleased to see my director here. Hi, Mel. <laughs> um, so, my journey's been nowhere near as exi exciting as Mel's, of course. Um, I only began law, honestly. Um, with the help of my mum, she pushed me into this route because she honestly had enough of me questioning every single rule decision um, request that she'd made throughout my childhood. I was always one of those, why, what happens, or, you know, that sort of, not naughty, but inquisitive child. So I think she had enough of me and she said, you know, I think you need to put your money where your mouth is and go and do law. I did initially want to be an actor. I then also wanted to become a cabin crew member and then one day like I said um, I found myself in a situation where I was faced with either doing some uh, following a career where I felt like I would enjoy myself but would not necessarily be helping people which is essentially what I like to do I like to help and assist as much as I can and I found that if I follow law, eventually I will hopefully become, um, like get, to, get into a position where I can help people just by having my knowledge and my experience. And yes, of course it's paid, but 
it's just the whole general concept of okay I can put my knowledge to good use um, and to be honest I didn't actually take law seriously up until perhaps my third year of my undergraduate degree where I realized okay if I don't actually study hard right now and flip everything um, that I've done up to this time I'm not going to get a good grade so it, I think it was at that point I, I thought to myself okay I need to be serious about it and then it just changed for me my, I didn't I began to love it I think the, the more you read law I think you just learn to love it and that was my process I just love it now and as you can see I've got a bookshelf full of law books I can't say I've touched them all but I do I do enjoy reading law and I think that's a good summary of my journey so far. Thank you. So could you just say a little bit about the role you're in now? Yeah, sure. So um, I work for the Department of Health and Social Care Legal Advisors, which Mel is um, director of. Um, my role there, um, so <laughs> I'm a paralegal and I assist the lawyers um, in delivering their advice to their policy clients, whether it's um, legal research or collating information for them. I th I'm just there basically, I build my experience as well as make their jobs and their lives essentially easier, I hope, you know. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that's my role there so much, but I, I basically, I do everything that a paralegal does there. Thank you. Um Moving on to a slightly more specific question, I can't come back to show that. Did you take part in any extracurricular activities in law school? Um, which ones were particularly valuable? And how important do you think it is taking part? Because I think a thing that we discuss a lot in the society is people being, you know, not having the confidence to go forward and join societies. So obviously we're trying to encourage that, but how important do you, do you find it? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And honestly, I can't stress the importance of um, extracurricular activities at uni. Um, I think they really do not just even make you a better candidate on paper, but just make you a better person in general. Um, so I, in first year, I don't think I really did much, <laughs> apart from maybe like got with my friends and obviously lectures. Um, but uh, at the end of first year, one of my friends was um, running for aspiring solicitors. And I thought at this point, I hadn't even decided fully decided what I wanted to pursue law as a career. I just knew that it was good. You know, I enjoyed studying it, but I kind of wanted to keep my options open. And I hadn't even really like attended any meeting. And this also goes to having, just kind of putting yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit, because yeah, I hadn't, um, done any sort of homework knowledge or anything like that I just sort of followed my friend to the to the AGM with her and I was like I'll vote um I'll vote for you um but then there was a position open and she was just like just go for it and I was like I haven't prepared a speech or anything <laughs> and like I did you get me like I was like I just didn't come prepared but she was like well like you literally have nothing to lose so I then got up I think at the time it was um I was a PR and like social media role for um, aspiring solicitors and it was like quite a new uh, society at, at uni then so I decided to go for it and yeah I got I got it and I was like oh wow okay <laughs> um, and through that I was able to sort of then really build my contact and like networking because aspiring solicitors would come in to um, obviously into to uni to like arrange events and things like that I was able to you know, speak to the people and um, coming in. I think I, I, we actually had like Chris White, the founder of Aspiring Solicitors as well, come in and help do loads of stuff um, and just really engage in things. And because of that as well, it was kind of, it kind of also opened my eyes more to, you know, law firms in general. I sort of grew my own knowledge and kind of, it, it gave me a better idea of the type of law as well I wanted to do and the type of firms that I liked as well. Um, Cause I didn't really know much. Like I would go to law fairs, but mostly just to like get freebies <laughs> um, and things like that. So um, it wasn't until second year that I started obviously really kind of get engaged. In, but I think that probably wouldn't have happened as well if I didn't sort of come out do step on my comfort zone you know right towards the end of first year um another thing I also did in second year um 
is I, I, I did uh, sort of volunteer um, role. So it's called Global Brigades. And I'm not sure if it's still running, but it was sort of, um, they had different factors. They had economics, law, um, and you do travel to sort of developing countries and to like rural areas and you would sort of arrange, go with a group of volunteers and to help like the local community and, and things like that. So I did it with the law of uh, the human rights brigade. And we went to, I'd say it was in the summer of my second year, we went to um, Panama and it was absolutely brilliant. I honestly possibly, like it was quite a few years ago, but I still mention it all the time in interviews and people are quite intrigued with it as well. So not only was it a brilliant experience for my CV, like, you know, having to raise money myself, um, you know, interacting with other volunteers and become really good friends with them, um, doing pro bono clinics. Uh, and when we were out there, you know, dealing with language barriers as well, just so many things that like I do, I think it just opened up many experiences I don't think would have been possible um, if, you know, I just sort of was a bit afraid to sort of go for it as well. And the University of Vermont is absolutely brilliant in terms of supporting you. Um, I think they had the I apply for the gateway bursary and I'm pretty sure it's still something that's quite available now. And they were like luckily able to fund um, a, a good chunk of the trip for me as well. So that was another brilliant extracurricular that I did that I think really, really sort of um, boosted um, my CV a lot. And just me as a person, it was such an amazing experience, very humbling and I just came out of it like a new person. Um, I also did a couple of, um, I think I did like kickboxing for a bit as well. <laughs> um, and I think so just also not just law related as well, but you try to like do just anything that's like really odd that kind of just shows you're a well-rounded person. Um, because at the end of the day, everyone has that two one, or well, not everyone has a two one, but do you get what I mean? Like majority of people will come out with a two one, you know, have similar grades. I think the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, employers kind of want to see people that they can relate to, that have a bit of personality to them, that, you know, someone that at the end of the day, you're not always going to work in 24 um, seven. You always want to have a, bit, have a bit of chat to you, have a bit of, you know, personality. So and I think those experiences sort of build you as well. Thank you. Um, my next question was going to be, um, is there anything in particular that helped you get the um, work at the government legal department? Sure. Um, so my story to that is a bit weird as well. Um, I was actually, um, I don't think I went into it the normal route uh, as you do. Um, so I was made redundant earlier in the year after the whole like just before corona started like and so I was sort of applying to everywhere <laughs> and recruitment was frozen and things like that so it was a bit like panicky um but one of my friends um she was actually in law school with another paralegal department of education and um, I guess he had told her about it that I want someone's leaving um and she said well if you, are you looking for beautiful and he was like yeah so I I found out about the opportunity and I just didn't even wait. I do I'm not sure they even got a chance to um, <laughs> advertise for it. So I got in contact with uh, the manager um, and the Department of Education and I sent him my CV, my cover letter, and basically just said I'll be the best person for this role. <laughs> and um, obviously, I went to I still had an interview process and things like that, but it, I don't think it was like a, it wasn't a formal recruitment where I applied online. Um, but I would say you know the things that helped me go for it. I think this also goes back to sort of stepping outside your comfort zone. Um, I think just having that extra push and you know essential is a bit slang a bit of colloquial terms but you just have to shoot your shot um and just sort of take any opportunity that you see essentially as well and just really really boost um any experience that you have as well even if it's just um i mean lucky i had experiences i had already paralegal before um but i also put in some of my extra curricular experience and just say you know i have got great attention detail um strong research skills as well because one thing I noticed in uh, the government legal profession is as a paralegal you do do a lot of um, research and um, to assist lawyers as well um, and, but it doesn't necessarily have to even be from your um, even if you don't have any like 
work experience, you could even just relate it to your actual um, law degree. Like you do a lot of research and how you gain strong retail skills from that. Um, any group work that you do with people as well, just, you know, say you're a great team worker, because um, you're it's a very collaborative role that's what I found working at the DFE you work with so many people and there's so many moving parts as well so I think it's, it's just a combination of loads of things but I would 100% say just any opportunity you see you just take it because you just never know what will come out of it. Okay thank you that's great um if I could come to Mel just to ask obviously you've had a lot of experience and I don't know to what extent you've been involved in recruiting at any point. Um, is there any particular work experience that you would see as highly valuable or that you would look for in a candidate? A really good question. And, um, you know, my colleagues who have spoken um, already about the sorts of things that, uh, that they have done to support their applications, I think is uh, really important. I would stress the point that, actually a lot of candidates look the same on paper. So having a point of difference, differentiating yourself out is really important. And for the government legal profession, being able to demonstrate that you've got an interest in public service and interest in, in public affairs can be a really important way in. But we are looking for people who bring a range of skills. We don't just want brilliant lawyers, frankly, we want people um, and you've heard already, you're able to collaborate, you're able to work uh, to support uh, their colleagues that bring, you know, that ability to take on responsibility. So anything you do in an extracurricular way that can demonstrate that is really helpful. So, you know, lots of people do pro bono work. And again, pro bono work maybe shows that you've got that commitment to supporting the public public service ethos. That can be really helpful. Volunteering. Um, generally can be really helpful in, in that sort of regard. Uh, we recruit people obviously as paralegals, we also recruit people as uh, trainees, so we've got a trainee uh, programme, we have about 75 people across the government legal profession, about 40 or so of whom are within the government legal department. Um, but we also recruit qualified lawyers, so I came in as a qualified lawyer. And one of the things that we do when we um, interview for qualified lawyers is we are checking that your motivational fit actually suits GLD that's something really about your values are your values uh, in accordance with our values we we hold our values very very dear and you know you don't get paid as much money as you do in other parts of the profession you know certainly not in comparison to the bar or the private sector so therefore you've got to want to do this work so quite a lot of the uh, questions that we'll be asking you are about you know really what what your motivation is for coming into the government legal service and therefore if you can show that through your extracurricular activities or your broader profile uh, with the work that you've done that you've got that interest in public service or you've got that interest in where politics and law collide you know you you, you will certainly be a candidate that is going to put your differentiate yourself from others we also see lots of people who have done things like MOOCs, um, who have done the free representation unit. I think they still are around. So, um, you know, if they are and if you've got an opportunity to go and support by giving advice to people through the free representation unit and actually advocating for people, that's great. If you are somebody who's looking to be um, one of our trainees but come in through the pupillage route, you know, go to court, demonstrate that you've gone to court. If you've got an opportunity to do many pupillages, I would certainly do that. But in many respects, it is about showing us what you've learned from all the experiences that you've had. So, you know, for example, when I was at university, I set up the Jazz and Blues Society and I was quite lacking in confidence and I wasn't sure whether or not that was something I could pull off. But I really pushed myself out of my comfort zone, you've heard that phrase used before already, um, pushing myself out of my comfort zone to do something that I wasn't necessarily um, thinking that I would necessarily be any good at, but then demonstrating what I'd learned from that experience. That was as valuable as anything else that I might have, have been able to put on my CV. You're on mute, Louisa. 
Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, if I could just come to Gamzi now about um, if you had any work experience that you particularly valued and if at any point you struggled to find work experience and what you did to overcome that. Okay, so I was somehow quite lucky, I would say, because during one of the summer holidays um, on, in my undergraduate degree, I was able to somehow land a job as a personal injury fee earner. So during those few months between um, in the summer holiday, I was able to get really, really good experience with um, within civil litigation. And I would say that I was definitely thrown into the deep end there, but I think that gave me, I hit the ground running definitely with um, that. I then, so that was just a few months. I then finished, went back to uni and did my last module um, part-time. And two days after my final exam, I went into another job. Again, I just applied knowing that my exams were coming and as soon as they finished, I was gonna be free. And you know you need money, you need to live. So it was I needed to get a job as soon as possible. Those few months of um, litigation experience gave me, I, I'd say, there was like the golden key to my legal career because having put that on my CV, it gave me the ground to apply for other fee owner jobs. And somebody gave me a chance, and I was there for two years until one day. I got a telephone call from an agent basically saying that there's a job at the government legal department and would I like to be put forward? I said yes, thinking that there's no way I'm gonna get in there to be honest. So I said, yeah, go for it. It was actually for the Department of Education initially and they, I got an email saying that it, I would be um, considered at a later date basically and not on this occasion and then a few weeks later, I got another email from the agent saying that he'd like to put me forward for a DHSE, DHSE LA job. And I said, go for it. Um, and again, that was luck. I went to the interview thinking that I'm not, they're not going to accept me. And to be honest, maybe it was that, the fact that I didn't, I went in with a cool head. It, the fact that I thought they wouldn't take me, it meant that I was a lot calmer. And when it comes to my interview time, I performed well, apparently, because again, my, my agent called me a few days later and said that they wanted to um, employ me, which I was very shocked about, I have to say, I was very shocked. And that did kind of give me a little bit of imposter syndrome, if I do, if I do say, you know, that is quite important as well. Um, so my own difficulties were not so much in getting the job, but believing that I should be there and I was qualified enough to be there um, and I think just just going forward just keep going forward just ask questions you're going to make mistakes you're going to fall but just getting back up I think that was my own journey so that was my me overcoming my difficulties mainly I think I'm not sure if I've answered the question <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so would you say in terms of sort of getting over that imposter syndrome, it's just, you know, every day showing up and just trying? Yeah, exactly that. Just trying and thinking, okay, I mean, everybody around me is clearly smart, so they can't be that wrong, you know, in their decision. They must see something. And yeah, some, sometimes it is just like, okay, just remember that if, even if you don't believe that you have it, you might do and others can see it so it's literally just about just keep going keep going do extra work if you need to ask questions and just keep going and hopefully you will get over your imposter syndrome i think i slowly have thank you louisa louisa can i just jump in here because i think this is a really important point that gamza raises about imposter syndrome do you know what i think loads of people have got that and just understanding that that is not an abnormal or unusual um, position to find yourself in. I think most of us, you know, when I was first a director, I thought to myself, oh, bloody hell, they can't have put me in as a director. What's wrong with these people? But I've mentored a lot of uh, people right the way through their careers over the years, and I have seen imposter syndrome more than I haven't. And at some point, you've got to trust 
that you guys are at a brilliant university studying law. Um, others of you are you know, in posts where you've been through a competitive process. I think you have to accept that you know, the people who are bringing you in through those processes know what they're doing. You know, they know whether or not someone is good enough to do the job that they're being asked to do. They know whether you're good enough to be studying at a great university. And you have to take some confidence, I think, from that. And if you think of imposter syndrome as another, from another um, uh, direction, if you see it as really it's your protective self saying, don't get yourself into a position of danger, be careful, be careful. And you can see it just as a way of warning you to take care because you're stepping outside your comfort zone. We're back into that sort of language again. If you can see it as, you know, just a way of helping you to think about the things that you need to do to ensure that you can step safely outside your comfort zone. I think you begin to see it as a way of helping you rather than hindering you. You start to get out of your own way. Because mostly, if I'm honest, I've supported a lot of people to promotion to the senior civil service, which is a little bit like um, a partnership, uh, taking becoming a partner or, or becoming a QC in private practice. And very often they are people who are standing in their own way. There is nothing in the system that is holding them back. So you've got to allow yourself to move out of your way in order to progress. Sorry, I just thought I'd jump in at that point. I hope that was okay. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, if I could come back. To, oh, sorry, would you like to say something? I see. No, no, I was just saying thank you, Mel. Absolutely agree. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Um, if I could come back to Sherifa and ask about applying for legal roles during a degree, is that something that was difficult to manage time and workload with? Thank you, 100%. Um, <laughs> I was, I think I only started really taking applications seriously in final year. Um, I mean, I did do some in second year as well, but um, I think then I just wasn't really sure what direction. So I kind of just wanted to do a bit of everything before I really decided what path I wanted to take. Um, yeah, it is difficult, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. But I think it's sort of just trying to balance uh, balance it and just being very uh, particular about where you're making applications to um, and just yeah trying to sort of also build some sort of routine as well so in final year I was sort of treating uh, my days like a nine to five so I was treating like going to uni nine to five and then in the evenings um, like when I felt like I was not as burnt out I would work on my applications but equally when I felt oh you know, I don't know if I have enough energy in the evening to do this. I'm sort of prioritise my workload and maybe do half a day uni work and then the rest half the day do applications. Um, and, you know, it, it wasn't um, easy. Um, I think in my that cycle, I think I only got one um, invite to an assessment centre. Uh, it, it was just a bit difficult because you think, oh, you spent all this time um, in it, but practice makes perfect as well. As much as you should also... As much as you should you know be meticulous about the firms that you apply to as well i also think there is it is a numbers game at the end of the day and the more you do the better you get as well um so one thing i'd probably encourage to do to be able to sort of balance that is maybe trying to do applications as early as possible um so that way um the more the earlier you do even if you are getting rejections you kind of you feel you kind of feel it out like what stage you're getting to um um, early so if you're getting if you're getting rejected at application stage then you know you probably need to just work on your applications a little bit better and that also me means that there are still more um, places open because the deadline's still quite far away so you can then just sort of you know sort of manage and plan your strategy as well um yeah it is it is difficult but i think one also brilliant thing that i think i like about the way law application cycles are as well is that you know, if you are going for just direct TCs as well, a lot of them do end in summer. So, you know, if you do feel, and I, there was a one point I thought that, you know, this is binary, it's very, very important. And um, I think I just need to put applications on hold for a little bit. I just sort of put 100% of my focus on 
uh, my uni work and you know once we finished in like June you still had like a month to do applications until like the 31st of July deadline whenever it was as well so yes yeah, so I think it's just a bit balancing it. Thank you um I know I'm going through that at the moment, so I could relate to that. Um, um, would you also be able to talk a little bit about how, because I know Gamzee's spoken about this, but how you found your job in the government legal department? Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I found it brilliant as well. Like I said, I, I keep on scaring up, but I've been really lucky with this job, honestly. And I, my family, you know, I can't stop raving about it. I'm just like, <laughs> my mood in general, I'm just a lot happier. And I've been saying that, though I'm still very, very junior in my career, um, I don't know if I'm going to go back to private practice because <laughs> I just really enjoy it here. Um, the, but the Department of Education and I'm get, now I know it's all of the other departments because Mel sounds absolutely supportive and just incredible, but they are the most supportive people that I've ever worked with. Um, I also, just like Andy, I had a bit of imposter syndrome starting, you know, because I have to be made redundant, like, honestly, it knocks your confidence a little bit. And and I was sort of trying to find a role and, I, I, and it was during lockdown as well. So, <laughs> you know, there's all these things going on. So I was just kind of feeling a little bit down. Um, so when the role did come through. I, what actually happened is that like there was a bit of a gap where um, I had actually got the role earlier, um, I think around April, but I didn't find out until June because there was a lack of communication. So I imagine my shock when out of nowhere they got back to me and said, you got it. So I was like, <laughs> um, and yeah, so I came in just feeling very like um, a bit nervous because I hadn't actually done any public law apart from me at university I had just done um, commercial litigation and um, that was it really so but everyone was just inc incredible every piece of work I would actually get feedback on which is unheard of for me anyway um, in, in, in private practice they're just everyone's just too busy <laughs> um, from my experience as well to even sort of sit you down so sort of give you feedback but don't get me wrong, in DfE, everyone's also busy with coronavirus, things going on, but they always made sure they sat me down um, and helped me and gave me um, incredible feedback. Um, my transition there was also quite tough as well because it was all virtual, so I haven't actually been to the office of many of my, my any of my colleagues in person, so I've just been working remotely since July, but it just hasn't felt strange, too strange at all, because they've just all been absolutely welcoming. Um, someone would just call me, just like, oh, just check in how you are, just like, just have, I've just called me for like a normal chat and just checking to see how I am and things like that. And it's just, it's just been so, so, um, just very encouraging. And in the sense that like any sort of imposter syndrome or, you know, feeling of, um, I guess not being, uh, maybe not feeling not feeling inadequate, but just feeling like, oh, I don't deserve this. That was quickly sort of um, kind of wiped away because everyone was just very supportive. And um, I remember the first piece of work that I did and I sat down, I had finished it and I sat down in there just staring at it for like an hour before I sent it off because I just was not sure at all. But, you know, I just got really good feedback on it. And even if it's not good feedback, it's not overly critical. Um, it's very, very constructive as well. So I honestly, I would definitely encourage everyone to apply to GLD. I think they are very, very, um, um, they're very, very big on development. And even if no matter how much, how long you're there for, I think you just come out of it being like a better person or a better lawyer as well. Thank you. That sounds really positive. Um, Mel, would you be able to talk a little bit about applying to the GDR? I know there's a lot of roles in the department itself, but would you be able to talk a bit about maybe the route for sort of solicitors and barristers? Yeah, let me do that. It's a long time since I was making my application, but I know I've supported um, or had people in to my division who've recently made that application. But also, can I just emphasise what Shofa and Gamzee have both said? You know, we see it as a proper invest to save. If we invest in people who come in, we just get better lawyers and a better quality of work. So it's really important to us that we do that. That's a deep part of our culture. 
but also you know I work with some of the nicest most interesting people you know what we are able to offer I think at the government legal um, department you know it's been crazy mad on covid and if i'm honest me and my team have been working round the clock uh crazy hours doing some extraordinary groundbreaking things but work-life balance is incredibly important to us so i've got four children i mean i don't know that i could have gone got to the position that i've got to and have four children in any other organization frankly um, that, that I have uh, anticipated and that is because of the kind of support that we give people from the very first moment they join. But let me tell you a bit more about um, applications. So we have what, what is known as an always on application process. So if you are a qualified lawyer, you can make your application at any time to us. And we have waves of recruitment rounds. So, you know, we, you'll, we'll bring you in, we will uh, interview you and because we need a lot of lawyers partly because of coronavirus partly because of EU exit and various other priorities that this particular government has you know what, what we'll do is if you're successful is we will allocate you to um, a division and they will call you up and, and talk to you a bit more about the jobs that are on offer so we take people at what is known as grade seven so that's junior lawyer um, occasionally, we will take people in a senior lawyer level, um, particularly for some of the specialist roles, so litigation, commercial and employment particularly, but also into the general advisory work. And advisory work is working in departments, advising people who are making policy. But we also have a really rigorous and highly respected training contract. And my goodness, you know, the numbers, one of my colleagues gave me some of the numbers. It is really competitive. So I think we had uh, 5,800 applicants this year for 78 positions. I mean, you know, those stats are really hard. I don't want to put anyone off, but, you know, you need to understand it's a highly competitive process. And what we do is we have... Um, online application forms we give you a situational judgment test there is verbal reasoning there is a critical reasoning test as well so there is a slew of tests that we ask you to do online we do um ask for a minimum of a 2-2 you know lots of people do have better than 2-2 but you know we recognize that actually very often the skills that we're looking for aren't necessarily just dictated to by a particular you know degree standard Having said that, the people who join us are definitely, you know, um, incredibly impressive people. The trainees are extremely strong. So after the online application process, the highest scoring people come to an assessment centre where there is a written exercise. And there's also an interview uh, with two senior government lawyers and an independent person. And then after the assessment centre, the decision is made as to how many people get through and as I say there's about 75 78 got through last year about 40 of those will come to the government legal department and the other 30 will go to other government uh, bodies particularly HMRC that's uh, revenue and customs people who are responsible for tax but we also bring people um, in a training level to uh, departments like the National Crime Agency so there's a whole range of people that will get those other 30 trainees. Now, if that feels a bit daunting, you know, let me assure you, sometimes people make two or three applications before they get through. Um, you know, it is worth, if it's what you want to do, it is worth uh, being proactive and keep on keeping on. But we have other routes in. So you've heard from my colleagues about coming in via the paralegal route. That's a really good route in, actually. Um, if you're then going to go for a training contract, you still have to go through, at the moment at least, you still have to go through that external route. But if you've qualified as a lawyer um, and you come in as a paralegal or indeed a locum, again, you can apply for the always on process, which is for qualified lawyers. Again, sometimes people make two, some, sometimes people make two or three applications before they get on, but it is always worth persevering. We are looking to broaden um, our other routes in so we're um, developing apprenticeships at the moment and bringing people in to get their silex qualifications so they qualify as legal executives but really just to reassure you there's a number of routes in 
you know, our standards are high. The work is without question uh, demanding. It's also absolutely fascinating. But, you know, what we give you in return for that is just a real commitment to your development and your growth at every stage of your career. Plus, I know it's been busy for those of us, Gamzee will tell you, it's been incredibly busy at DH, but we have a real respect for people's work-life balance. We want to encourage people to en enable them to live their lives, not just work every every minute of every day. Thank you, Lau. Um, I sort of have a question for all our guests and whoever really wants to speak about it first or if anyone wants to jump in, that's fine. Um, so as a woman in law, um, how have you found the sector and have you ever faced any barriers and have you been involved in any diversity networks? And if so, how important have you found that in sort of counteracting any barriers you have faced? Can I jump in just really quickly because I've touched on this already from my perspective, you know, the government legal profession is really good um, at equality. We have got uh, the numbers, I wonder if I've got the stats to hand, but we've got um, probably more women than men at the moment, particularly in the most senior bits of the profession. So uh, we have at my level and above, uh, we are around about 70% women and 30% men um, are the layer below me. So I, I liken that to becoming a partner or a QC, we are around 55% women and 45% men. We've got 26% of us declared BME, um, so that's black and minority ethnic, 9% uh, declared disabled. So we care very much about diversity and inclusion. It's one of the things that we really focus on. We have a DNI strategy, a diversity and inclusion strategy. We have targets for getting people from the BAME community and from the disabled uh, uh, community into those most senior roles. Having said that, I'm only one of two directors who come from a, um, a, a BAME background in the government legal department. That's not good enough, but I think we recognise that that's not good enough. And I've certainly been instrumental in helping people be promoted um, from BAME backgrounds to more senior positions. We have really thriving networks and they are one of the key ways that we help people to overcome barriers. So I myself, um, the champion for the parents network, lockdown has affected lots of us who are parents quite critically. I'm also a member of the race network, the LGBT network, the gender network, we've got a greener GLD network, uh, you name it, we've got it. And we often do joint events so that we tackle some of those areas of intersectionality where you've got you know, two uh, protected characteristics that might collide and, and might impede your progress. So I just really wanted to say from, from you know, the organization's perspective, this is, this is stuff that really matters to us and we're absolutely shifting the dial on some of those barriers that, that stop people from, from getting on. But I'll leave my younger colleagues to say more about that. That's really great, thank you. So, um, Sharifa or Gams, do you have anything to add, especially about diversity networks or anything that's particularly helped you? Sorry, Sharifa, if you just unmute. <laughs> no. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I was part of Aspiring Solicitors um, through my second and third year at uni on the committee. So that was very good um, in terms of being part of a diverse, um, diversity initiative um but also what i would say like once you're sort of outside of uni once you graduate um you know when you don't have that uni bubble there have been some um, incredible organizations that i've sort of been um, following that really helped me so there is mostly it's mostly um sort of for black women but there is um black women in law I'm sure if you search them on LinkedIn, um, they would they they'll be very helpful. They pr um, give really good advice, um, and you get to sort of speak to other Black women in law as well. Um, and you see senior lawyers that you know have sort of 
gone through those barriers um, and faced those challenges and how they've succeeded. There's also another one called W Can as well, and they really good, um, present really good opportunities as well to network with law firms. And within um, DFE um, that I've been working at, we've got incredible um, sort of diversity initiatives going on at the moment. We have something called um, race discussion. And so um, every once in a while we sort of just, we, uh, we pick like a book or like a documentary. And um, the last one I think we did was why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. And we sort of discussed the chapters and it was just really good. I think seeing people's thoughts and I think you know, this following on the, off the back of Black Lives Movement, I think a lot of people just weren't really aware. And, and those sort of discussions kind of really highlights, you know, the problem and how it permeates, you know, different industries, especially the legal industry. And so it was really helpful discussions. And recently we actually discussed, just like Mel mentioned, you know, what the stats are like, um, you know, for um, ethnic minorities in the GLD and the legal industry in general. But I will say on hand that the DFE um, has probably been the most diverse place I've ever worked at. <laughs> and I have seen more people that look like me than um, in private practice. And so, you know, you just kind of feel that sense of belonging um, as well. Thank you. Um, does anyone have anything else to add on that subject? Um... Because I'm conscious on time because obviously it was meant to finish at 6.30. But I just wanted to ask you if there was anything else that you wanted to share, any sort of final piece of advice. And then if anyone's got any questions, but I'm aware we're slightly over time. So if you have to go, that's OK. I don't have anything substantial to add anyway. I think Mel said everything that could be said. OK, thank well. you. And <laughs> that's... I would definitely agree though, GLD has definitely opened my eyes to the, just a diversity program completely. I've actually never seen any companies or anything of the sort be so interested in it and genuinely interested in it because, you know, they, we have events, we have national interest calendars and all sorts of nice and colorful things that are centered around being, you know, inclusive and diverse. And yeah, that's all I would add basically. I think that's it. Okay, just to anyone on the call, if you've got any questions, um, just put them in the chat. Um, but if not, um, I think we're gonna have to wrap up. Is that my message? It doesn't look like anyone's got any questions. So thank you so much for joining us on this call. It's been really insightful and I'm sure everyone listening has really enjoyed it too. Um, really appreciate the time that you've taken out of your day for this. Thank you. Thanks, thank for, you. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for hosting. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.